Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event today. I'm very excited uh, for it. Um, today's talk is um, hold on here, I'm just moving stuff. Is at the threshold: German Yiddish encounters and missed encounters in Weimar Berlin. So this conversation is going to be about uh, East European Jews, and I'm I'm doing this because there's a lot of discussion about what these definitions actually even mean, but um, East European Jews who had immigrated and lived in Berlin in the 1920s during the Weimar Republic and the kind of um, cultural uh, cross-pollination, let's say, that took place in Berlin at that time. I think many of us often think of the Great Divide uh, or think of that history as a Great Divide between the German-speaking Jews of Germany, of Berlin in this particular case, and the East European Jews who lived in their own communities, at least in, the, in, in theory, or how we might think of it today, for example, in Scheunenbiertel and so on, in the central areas of Berlin. Um, uh, but, but in truth, there was also a lot of meeting of these two groups and cultural things that came out of that. Uh, this um, event is in conjunction with the concert tomorrow night. This concert's in the chat, and you can click on it. And it's also going to be on Zoom, so you don't have to go um, in person to see it. Uh, it's called Challenging the Theater of Memory, Yiddish Song Beyond Kitsch and Stereotype. And what this program tomorrow night is going to look at is it's going to look at the story of uh particularly in music, of uh, Yiddish and klezmer music in, in Germany, but in the case of this concert, more in post-war Germany, 1945 up to the present time. So this talk is kind of looking at another uh, meeting of these two populations um, before that time. So it's kind of a little bit meant as a, as a prologue to the concert tomorrow night. And I should also say the concert tomorrow night is also going to have um, uh, kind of, it's gonna be interspersed with talks and discussions about uh, Yiddish music, uh, klezmer music in uh, Germany, 1945 and after. And it goes into uh, how, how Jews and how the Holocaust are remembered in contemporary Germany would be the final point of that. So um, I'm very happy today to have as our guest who's going to present the talk, uh, Rachel Selig. So I'm going to introduce her right now. Rachel Selig is a scholar of modern Jewish literature and she is a freelance writer as well, based in Toronto. She is the author of Strangers in Berlin, Modern Jewish Literature Between East and West, 1919 to 1933. This book was published in 2016. Um, and uh, I think uh, we were talking right before this event. Um, I think a lot more scholars now are engaging in this topic and um, have maybe, I don't want to say taken it further, but have explored more facets of it. Uh, Rachel has held teaching and research appointments at Harvard, Columbia, the University of Michigan, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and the University of Toronto, where she currently teaches in the Department of Germanic Languages and Literature. Her non-academic writing can be found on her website. Um, so Rachel, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. I look forward to your presentation and to learning more about uh, this meeting. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you so much for inviting me, for having me. And thank you also for introducing the uh, scare quotes, which you'll probably notice me doing um, fairly often, almost sort of as an automatism um, during my it's talk. It's hard with this subject not to do it's that. It's very hard because, because we're, we're already talking... redefining everyone. Exactly. And we're, we're talking about perceptions of self and other, which of course involves stereotyping and preconceived notions. So I'll touch upon that in my talk. Um, 
uh, but it's it's this maybe also provides some fodder for discussion after because I'm sure a lot of you come are coming to this talk with your own preconceived ideas about who were so-called Vestuden, Western Jews versus Ostuden, East European Jews. Um, so I'm just going to share uh, my screen. And Michael, you'll chime in uh, if if there are any issues with the presentation on my end, everything looks it certainly okay. will. It looks great. Okay, great. So I'm going to just launch right in. Um, in the summer of 1923, Franz Kafka traveled to Müritz, a small lakeside town in northern Germany, to seek relief for his tuberculosis in the fresh air. He wrote a letter while he was there to his old friend Hugo Bergmann, who was living at that point in Palestine, and he described his surroundings. Fifty paces from my balcony is the holiday, holiday colony of the Jüdisches Volksheim Berlin. Through the trees, I can see the children playing, happy, healthy, spirited children, Ostjuden rescued by Westjuden from the dangers of Berlin. Half the days and nights, the home, the forest, and the beach are filled with song. When I am among them, I'm not quite happy, but I am at the threshold of happiness. Kafka was describing a kind of summer camp run by the Berlin Jewish People's Home or the Jüdisches Volksheim, which was set up in the Scheunenviertel, which Michael just mentioned, um, remembered as Berlin's Jewish quarter. It wasn't a, an official Jewish quarter, but it was a kind of working class inner city neighborhood um, with a very visible Eastern European immigrant, uh, Jewish immigrant population. And the Volksheim was set up to provide aid to East European Jewish refugees who had been displaced by war and pogroms. One of the Volksheim volunteers whom Kafka met in Müritz was Dora Diamant. She was a Yiddish speaking rabbi's daughter from Poland, and she was very well versed in Hasidic music and stories. So I imagine that her voice must have been among those of the happy children whose Hebrew and Yiddish songs Kafka heard from his balcony. Although Kafka could not claim complete happiness while in Müritz, remember that his body was ravaged by sickness, the sound of children singing in Yiddish and in Hebrew brought him to the threshold of happiness, for der Schwelle des Glucks. Kafka and Dora fell in love in Müritz. And this summer romance was so significant that Kafka, who, for those of you who know anything about Kafka, was known for not for being pretty afraid of commitment, decided that he was going to leave Prague behind and follow Dora to back to Berlin, where she was living. And he remained there for several months, nearing the end of his life. In Berlin, Franz and Dora dreamed about their future. And there are many stories about this. Sometimes they imagined running a restaurant in Tel Aviv. The idea was that she would cook and he would be the waiter. I think he would have been a terrible waiter. Um, other times they talked about joining a farming collective in Galicia. Right, so somewhere in the East, be it Eretz Israel or Eastern Europe. But of course, Kafka's rapidly deteriorating physical condition made it very obvious that neither fantasy was going to come true. The brief time that Kafka spent in Berlin was a time of sickness, both for the writer and for the city. Upon his arrival in the fall of 1923, he discovered a city that was in the throes of spiraling inflation, staggering unemployment, political violence between left and right. And he sort of tried to insulate himself from, um, from this, this chaotic urban reality by settling in the leafy steglitz zehlendorf uh, neighborhood on Berlin's western edge. Of course, tuberculosis was a pretty fierce adversary and his, his health became worse and worse. His battered windpipes were eventually unable to produce much more than a kind of wheezing sound. And so like the hero of one of his famous parables before the law, Kafka remained at the threshold, right? Never quite to cross over to true happiness. Now, I chose to begin my talk um, with this story for two reasons. First, because of the reference to East European Jewish songs. And tomorrow, as Michael already mentioned, Isabel Frey and Benji Fox Rosen will be giving a wonderful concert of Yiddish songs 
um, at the Leo Beck Institute. Um, and I'd really like to thank the Institute and especially Michael Simonson for inviting me to offer this talk, which we can kind of see as, as, a, as a prologue, as he said, or maybe an overture to that concert. Thankfully for you, not a musical overture because none of you wants to hear me singing. Um, uh, so we can kind of think of, of this reference as connecting to tomorrow's event. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to also incidentally thank Monica Kuzma for her assistance today. The second reason I began with the Kafka story is that um, it introduces the focus of my talk, which is this encounter between German Jews and East European Jews, so-called, here come the scare quotes, Westjuden and Ostjuden. This encounter, I will argue, reached its apogee in Berlin between the wars. And so Berlin figures in my talk today as a Schwelle, as a threshold, a site of transition between East and West, and also between exile and homeland. It's this kind of in-between space. So I'm gonna proceed in three steps. First, I wanna offer some background to the meeting of East and West in interwar Berlin. Um, now, the idea that German Jews look down upon the Ostjuden and the word itself generally has a, has a pejorative ring has become received wisdom. But if we consider the two groups' mutual perceptions of one another over time, the picture becomes much more complex. This evolving relationship represents an important backdrop against which to look at the meeting of these two groups in Berlin between the wars in the so-called Weimar period. So I'm gonna be offering, um, for lack of a better term, a quick and dirty uh, portrait of this two-sided encounter over time. Second, I'll talk about how this imagined encounter became real around the First World War, and especially in the interwar period. And I'm going to be focusing on the role of Berlin. What made Berlin such an important, even unique locus for the East-West encounter? Um, more importantly, what role did the East-West encounter in Berlin play in Jewish cultural and national self-definition? And finally, I want to discuss a couple of examples that we might think of as, as outliers, um, exceptions to the rule, though not necessarily, um, examples of real encounters between German Jewish and Yiddish writers. And what I hope to show is that encounters between these groups, whether imagined or real, played an important role in Jewish cultural and national self-definition during this very volatile period. So German Jewish and Yiddish writers have a long history of imagining and portraying one another. Since the Haskalah, the, so the Jewish Enlightenment, which emerged in Germany in the 18th century, reached Eastern Europe in the 19th century, each group really looked toward the other as part of its own process of self-definition. Although German Jews were the first to be emancipated in Europe, this was the result of a slow and uncertain process. The Prussian Edict of Toleration of 1812 was the first step, but it would take another six decades or so until German Jews were granted full civil rights as part of German unification in 1871. The prevailing assumption during this period um, was that Jews would have to undergo intellectual and moral improvement to achieve the goal of emancipation. And so in this quest, German Jews begin to abandon the national dimension of their Jewishness and redefine themselves as so-called German citizens of the Mosaic faith. This meant that they had to dissolve ties with their fellow Jews from the East, right? They're not part of a shared nation of Jews, but rather German citizens first and foremost. And so East European Jews come to represent for assimilating German Jews, a kind of parochial self-segregating worldview and way of life. So in short, Westjuden took pains to distinguish themselves from the Ostjuden. As the winds of enlightenment blew eastward, the Yiddish speaking Maskilim, proponents of the Jewish enlightenment or Haskalah, developed a kind of idealized image of the German Jew um, or as, he, as the German Jew is known in Yiddish, the Deitch, 
And the Deitch became a kind of stock character in Yiddish Maskilic literature, um, portrayed usually as a paragon of reason and necessary religious reform. So a good example you can see in the slide here is Yisrael Axenfeld's Das Sterntichel, um, in which uh, a young Eastern a Galician Jew um, comes under the tutelage of a German Jew, a Deitch, who teaches him um, humanistic values um, uh, and, um, and, and allows him to sort of import these new um, reforming values into the shtetl when he returns there. So as long as German Jews were trying to portray themselves as more German than the Germans, um, as, the, as the phrase goes, they disparaged the Ostjuden. And as long as the Ostjuden embraced the values of reform and enlightenment, they idealized the Deitch. But this admittedly tense relationship evolved and transformed. Images of self and other really began to change um, most noticeably around the turn of the 20th century. Um, this is a time of rising nationalist movements um, and attendant anti-Semitism. And this forces both Eastern and Western Jews to question the limits of assimilation and integration and to rethink ideas of national identification. So among German Jews, there's this growing realization that assimilation had failed to provide complete equality. And this inspired a kind of re-examination of the hyphenated German Jewish identity as, as historians have often referred to it. And so part and parcel of this process was the transformation of the long maligned Ostjude, the Eastern Jew, um, into a symbol of ethnic and spiritual authenticity. So the most prominent example of this uh, would be in the writings of Martin Buber, his speeches, his Drei Reden über das Judentum, three speeches on Jewishness or Judaism, um, and his uh, Hasidic tales, uh, which he translated into German um, and uh, commented on, also took some artistic liberties in translating for his assimilated audience. Um, so these writings became uh, a kind of a spiritual guide for young German Jews, Franz Kafka among them, who had really grown disenchanted with the assimilated bourgeois values of their parents. Um, we might think, for instance, of Kafka's famous letter to his father, when he, where he criticized his father for um, not passing on his Jewishness to his children, saying to him, anything you did pass down just dribbled away in the process. Um, and, and, and if we look at the changing image of the German Jew, the Deitch, in Yiddish culture, we can see the opposite trajectory. Whereas the German Jewish image of the Ostjude evolved from a source of shame into a source of pride, the Deitch evolved from an object of admiration into a symbol of self-abnegation, maybe even self-hatred. Um, a great example is Sholem Aleichem's 1908 story, An Early Passover, a Frier Pesach, uh, which really lampoons the assimilated Jews of Germany. Um, the whole story, uh, or part of the story, I should say, takes place in the fictional city of Nuremberg. might sound a little bit like the German city of Nuremberg, but it's actually playing on, contains the word nar, meaning fool in Yiddish. So you can already get a sense of Sholem Aleichem's take on these German Jews who are so assimilated that they don't even know how to keep track of the Jewish calendar, wind up celebrating uh, Passover when they should be celebrating Purim, um, and so on. Uh, so as you can see, the relationship between German Jews and East European Jews that emerges um, in the pages of both German Jewish and Yiddish literature was complex and changing. Each group continuously revised its image of the other as it redefined its own conception of national belonging. In other words, the way each group portrayed the other tells us less about the other than about the portraying group's own self-perception. 
Um, there's, of course, there are many, many more examples that we can get into, and I'd be happy to elaborate on, on it uh, in the discussion. For the time being, though, I kind of, this is the, the prehistory to um, what I want to tell you about, what I want to focus on, which is the interwar period. Um, one thing I want to mention is you'll notice that up until now, I've kind of remained in the realm of imagined encounters, right? Um, imagined literary encounters. But imagination increasingly came into contact with reality around World War I and reached its zenith, as I said before, in the interwar period. And this was particularly visible in Berlin. In general, German Jews enthusiastically supported uh, the war effort in 1914. You can see in this image, um, Jewish soldiers um, standing in a synagogue, but in uniform, right, pow proudly serving the German fatherland. Um, there was an intense kind of jingoistic fervor in 1914. Even people that we tend to think of as 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 um, peace loving, uh, like Martin Buber, were very enthusiastic um, in joining the war effort in these early days. Um, but as the war continued. Um, Jews were made aware of their exclusion from the German nation building um, project. Um, there are two sort of significant events that are often highlighted um, as sort of driving this, this sense home for German Jews. Um, the first is was the border closing of 1914, the so-called Grenzschluss, which curtailed the mass westward migration of East European Jews. So remember that between 1881 and 1914, this is this period of mass emigration of Jews from Eastern Europe, um, roughly 2 million Jews leaving, most of them setting their sights on America. Um, but Germany was the main gateway to the West. Many of them settled either provisionally or permanently um, in Germany. And so this this sort of palpable influx of East European Jews at the end of the 19th century um, was something that came to kind of a screeching halt in 1914 because of this policy, this, this border closing. Things would change again by the end of the, wo the war, and I'll come to that soon as uh, Eastern European Jews start to come in in the wake of the Russian Revolution in the First World War. Um, but there was a tremendous amount of anti-Semitic vitriol that um, accompanied this policy, right? And so um, German Jews who had their own reservations about the influx of East European migrants, they saw these Ostjuden as a potential threat to their hard-won um, emancipation and assimilation into German society. Um, they began to rethink things. Hey, wait a minute, is this anti-Semitic vitriol directed exclusively at these newcomers or does it apply to us as well? Right? These are the kinds of questions that start to arise. Um, the second significant event was the Judenzählung, the Jewish census. This was a military uh, census um, of 1916, which was essentially designed to disprove Jewish involvement um, in, uh, in the war, um, to disprove the Jews' loyalty to Germany. Um, of course, it came out that Jews had enthusiastically enlisted in the military. Over 100,000 Jews served in World War I. And when those results came out, um, they weren't published. Uh, they were only leaked out uh, in, in a kind of dubious fashion. Um, and this was a major blow to German Jews who had seen themselves, of course, as very loyal to the country. Um, so, um, and and the real this realization that anti-Semitism was directed not only at Easterners, but also at German Jews themselves, became even more palpable during the Weimar period with the spread of this infamous stab in the back legend, the so-called Dolchstoss Legende, that placed blame for Germany's defeat in the war um, squarely on the Jews. So with all of these events, you know, the, the dealing with, in dealing with these events, German Jews begin to revise their image of the Ostjuden accordingly. Um, I will point out right now, I'm, I'm giving you uh, a bit of a schematic 
description of what went on. It wasn't it was complex. There were many German Jews who still sought, of course, to distance themselves from East European Jews. But there was a growing number of um, German Jews, particularly Jewish Jewish writers and intellectuals, who start to revise their image of the long maligned Ostjuden. And this transformation is especially pronounced in um, writing by um, in the works of writers who had contact with East European Jews, whether at home in Germany or while stationed on the Eastern Front. So I want to mention just two examples of that. <clears throat> so the two examples are the writers Arnold Zweig and Alfred Döblin, very, very different writers, contemporaries, both lived in Berlin, but very, very different. Um, not only in terms of um, style and choice of genre, but also um, in terms of their politics. Uh, both writers had firsthand experience of Jewish life in the Polish shtetls. Both were concerned with the material plight of East European Jews in this period. Um, and both were profoundly concerned with questions of Jewish nationhood more broadly. But these two writers, as I said, had vastly different political perspectives and therefore envisioned different solutions, both to the so-called Ostjudenfrage, the question of East European Jews, and to German Jewish um, national identity. Arnold Zweig's Das Ostjüdische Antlitz, the, the face of East European Jewry or the countenance of East European Jewry, which was published in 1920, was inspired by the time that Zweig spent on the Eastern Front with the German press corps. And um, the book is a series of highly stylized literary portraits um, accompanied by drawings by uh, the artist Hermann Struck, who was a fellow press corps member. And these portraits, these literary and, and visual portraits present this romantic view of Shtetl dwellers. Um, you have the cobbler, the homemaker, the yeshiva bocher, variety of characters. And throughout the text, these portraits are, are supplemented by or paired with negative commentary on um, assimilated German Jews who, in Zweig's words, have traded part of their soul with Europe, giving up part of their Jewishness. So he doesn't mince words here, right? You can get a sense of what his take on German Jewish assimilation at this particular juncture is. And uh, Zweig presented the face, the countenance, Antlitz is the sort of poetic word, um, of the Ostjude as a symbol of collective national unity. For him, the Ostjude was the paragon of the Jewish Volksgeist, the national spirit which he believed would be realized through the Zionist movement. Right? You can see it clearly in this passage that I've given you here. The old Jew, the man of the people, uh, got to move my screen here um, to be able to read it. The old Jew, the man of the people has just now worked out for himself the meaning of the appeal for a Jewish homeland in Canaan. Because it merely expressed, because it merely expressed, is merely, sorry, is merely expressed in a new political form um, that he always knew that this land was his land. Excuse the typos there. So very strong kind of Zionist sentiments coming through in this text. Um, so Alfred Döblin, um, by contrast, uh, was, was highly critical of Zionism. He had, therefore, a very different take on the fate of the Ostjuden. And um, Dublin regarded the Ostjuden not as a symbol of Jewish renewal or Jewish unity, but as the specter of fallen multi-ethnic empires. In other words, he saw the Ostjuden as quintessential cosmopolitans, very, very different kind of image than the one put forward by Zweig. Dublin is kind of an interesting figure because he had regular contact with East European Jews, both in Berlin and in Poland. Um, he was not only a writer, but also a doctor. He himself 
um, was raised uh, by a single mother in poverty. And so he always had this kind of um, affinity for, um, for, for the poorer um, people of Berlin, especially these, these immigrants. Um, and he was also an ardent leftist, um, was deeply concerned about anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric and sentiments that were on the rise in Germany. He was particularly shaken by a pogrom that broke out in the Scheunenviertel um, in November of 1923. It was November 5th, 1923. And um, uh, interestingly, we are com we commemorated just recently, just a couple of months ago, um, the 100 year anniversary of that event, um, which is something that for a long time was sort of overlooked by historians um, uh, for obvious reasons, overshadowed by Kristallnacht of 1938 and um, the, the, the Nazi pogroms on, um, uh, against the Jews during the Third Reich. But already in 1923, you know, the writing was on the wall. And this is something that Dublin was aware of and deeply shaken by. Um, the Scheunenviertel pogrom influenced Dublin to travel to Poland, the newly formed Polish Republic. Remember that Polish Republic doesn't come into existence until the end of the First World War. Um, and he goes there to write about, his desire anyway, was to write about the persecuted communities, Jewish communities, from which Berlin's uh, Jewish immigrants hailed. And the result was this very unusual travelogue, Reise in Poland, uh, journey, I guess you could call it journey to Poland or journey through Poland, um, which came out in 1925. Dublin's journey was ostensibly intended to, be, to become acquainted with the new Polish Republic, right? This is Germany's new neighbor to the East. Um, but it reads much, it reads more as a kind of diatribe against um, ethno-nationalist violence. And Dublin portrays Polish Jews as kind of collateral damage of this violence, as a symbol of failed multi-ethnic empires, of failed cosmopolitan ideals. So as you can see, we've got, if we look at Zweig and Dublin next to one another, both are interacting with East European Jewish life, whether in Germany or, abroad, or in Poland or in the East. Um, and, and kind of mobilizing images of the Ostjuden um, in order to make a commentary on the precarious nature of German Jewish assimilation and the problematic nature of um, modern ethnic national identity. Uh, but of course they reach very different conclusions. They have very different political uh, stripes and therefore portray the Ostjuden in different ways or to different ends. Um, Taken together, their writings reveal something important. Um, growing contact between German Jews and East European Jews prompted a, a kind of re-examination of the status of all Jew, all European Jews within an ethnically divided post-war context. German Jewish fascination with the Ostjuden was a response not only to increased contact, but also to the borders, the new borders, the newly drawn borders that divided these groups. Um, Zweig and Dublin both called Berlin home. Around the same time that their writings on the Ostjuden came to light, Berlin had also become a home, possibly a provisional home, to growing numbers of East European Jews, among them many Yiddish writers. And I'm gonna discuss some of them shortly, but first I wanna talk a little bit about the significance of Berlin as a kind of transit point between East and West, where this encounter between Ostjuden and Vestjuden took on new and important layers. Berlin between the wars was a threshold that was crossed in both directions, from the inside out and from the outside in. Jewish writers based there, even raised there, born and raised there, um, uh, as well as Jewish writers coming from abroad, whether they were coming or going, exiles in Germany or soon to be exiles from Germany, they experienced the city as a transitional site between a multi-ethnic imperial order and a new European order that was defined by 
these growing ethno-nationalist divisions. Berlin was the space where these two groups coexisted during this time of transition and change. Um, the historian David Myers described Berlin between 1919 and 1933, these are the bookends of the Weimar period, um, as a unique space and moment regulated by a cultural code that was neither Eastern nor Western, native nor foreign. So again, this kind of in-between space. Um, what made Berlin so special? Well, for one thing, it was a new city. After Germany's defeat in World War I and the establishment of a new democratic republic, remember today as the Weimar Republic, the capital was completely transformed. The 1920 Greater Berlin Act um, merged Old Berlin, which I'll see if my cursor can do this justice. Uh, hard to see the colors here, but this little yellow nugget at the center here, this is Old Berlin, like most European capitals, relatively small. Um, and this 1920, 1920 Greater Berlin Act merges this with all of the surrounding towns and villages. Um, suddenly Berlin, literally overnight, becomes this vast city of 20 boroughs. This means that its territory increased more than tenfold, and it was now connected through a vast network of rail lines to the rest of Europe. The rapid expansion of the city made it particularly attractive to immigrants, this already in the end of the 19th century, but even more so in the post-World War I period. Um, the population doubled, reaching nearly 4 million. So we're witnessing really the birth of a metropolis. Berlin becomes um, the second largest city in Europe, third largest city in the world. Um, this, is, this is something special. The rebirth of the city was, a, was in a sense symbolic of a broader process of national rebirth following Germany's humiliating defeat in World War I. And the word new, neu, was essentially the watchword of the day, right? In art, you had die neue Sachlichkeit, the new objectivity. In architecture, das neue Bauen. Um, uh, in, um, uh, in fashion um, uh, and, uh, and, and, um, uh, um, and in women's rights, the image of die neue Frau, the new woman. Um, so newness, right? This is, this is kind of the, the emphasis of, of the day. Um, and, and of course, this was part of the country's attempt to redefine itself, to undergo a kind of national makeover following this humiliating defeat. It's no surprise, of course, that the new Berlin was a magnet for newcomers. Um, as Ian Baruma put it, Berlin was always a marketplace for brash newcomers. More than that, among European capitals, Berlin was itself a brash newcomer. Many of these newcomers were East European Jews who were fleeing post-revolutionary violence um, and civil war in their native realm. Just to give you a sense um, of the numbers, at the turn of the 20th century, only about 5% of Berlin's Jews were foreign born. By 1925, East European Jews numbered roughly 25% of the city's Jewish population. So really significant demographic shift. Um, it, in the 1920s, Berlin's Jewish community numbered around 172,000. This was, by the way, one third of all Jews in Germany. So vast overrepresentation of Jews in the big city, not surprising. Um, and so by 1922, there were approximately 43,000 East European Jewish immigrants living in Berlin, right? They make up a quarter of Berlin, Berlin's Jewish community uh, or population, I, sh I should say. Community is maybe a misnomer. Um, the uh, Gershom Scholem recalls um, his time living in Pension Struck, um, a Berlin boarding house that became a temporary home after his father kicked him out of the house for being a Zionist and for his anti-war politics. Uh, Scholem went and lived in Pension Struck 
Um, a lot of ink has been spilled about this, this unusual place where a lot of famous people happen to pass through and, and spend some time. And Sholem remembers being the only, in his words, real Berliner among the mainly Yiddish-speaking inhabitants. His neighbor, incidentally, at Pension Struck was Zalman Rubashov, later Zalman Shazar, the third president of the State of Israel. Um, so it's just kind of a curious comment, right? Because what was a real Berliner is, of course, the question. What was a real Berliner in 19, the 1920s? To what extent did um, Yiddish writers who were coming to Berlin contribute to Jewish Berlin? Was Yiddish culture part of what we remember as the richness of Weimar Jewish culture? We tend to think of this as the heyday, as the high point of German Jewish life, right? The, in Peter Gay's words, the dance on the edge of the volcano. Um, and, and what was the result of the meeting of East and West in Berlin in this particular moment? Um, so while German Jewish writers like Zweig and Dublin were gazing and traveling east, growing numbers of Yiddish writers were traveling westward to Germany in the aftermath of World War I and the Russian Revolution. They were essentially trying to escape the crosshairs of ensuing civil war. And Berlin was the place where they were able to negotiate a homeless literary culture within a newly drawn European map. Berlin had a lot to offer as a temporary home for a homeless literary establishment. For one thing, Germany uh, had a very troubled economic situation um, after the First World War. And this was, interestingly, a kind of blessing for migrants coming with foreign currency. Uh, the Yiddish poet Avram Nochum Stenzel wrote, a foreigner with a London pound, a Dutch gilder, an American dollar could wander from cabaret to cabaret and saunter after midnight along the garishly lit Kurfürstendamm, ending up in a hotel with not one woman, but one on each arm. Um, of course, ref referencing also rampant prostitution during this period, which was another index of poverty and inflation. Um, Yiddish writers and publishers took advantage of the economic situation. Um, Berlin became a kind of a paradise for foreign publishers who were facing censorship and economic collapse in war-torn Eastern Europe. Between 1920 and 1924, um, Berlin was second only to Warsaw as the world's largest center of Yiddish publishing. These are just a few examples here in my slide um, of Yiddish books and periodicals. Uh, and you can see particularly the example on the right, Milgroim, this was actually a bilingual Yiddish Hebrew art and literary journal called Rimon Milgroim, the Yiddish and Hebrew words for pomegranate. You can see from the, the um, uh, production value alone, just from the colors, right, that they were able to produce things that were not possible in Eastern Europe at the same time. Um, so there were obvious economic and political um, reasons for Yiddish writers to settle in Berlin. But let's not minimize the appeal of the city itself. Berlin's reputation as a diverse, democratic, experimental, cultural hub was incredibly attractive, particularly to avant-garde writers who were looking to broaden their cultural horizons. Um, one example is the Vilna poet, um, remembered as the great bard of Vilna, Moshe Kulbach, who came to Berlin in 1920 and wrote very enthusiastically to his friend Shmuel Niger, um, Ich bin jetzt in Berlin, dos bin ich gekommen in Europa. I'm now in Berlin, and he wrote it you know, in bold Europe. I, I am now in Berlin. Finally, I've arrived in Europe, right? This was to him the epicenter of European culture. Kulbach spent three um, very lonely, but also very productive years in Berlin. And his time in the city inspired, among other things, the long poem, Child Herald of Disno, Disney Child Herald, which came out in 1928, once he had already resettled in um, Soviet Minsk. Um, and in this long poem, this young Lithuanian Jewish poet, not unlike Kulbach himself, is kind of dazzled, initially dazzled, let's say, and later swallowed whole by the German metropolis. Um, one of the stanzas reads, O land, wo die Elektre fließt in Drotten und in Oder Champagner, wo jeder Arbeiter is a Marxist, 
and yet the Kremer is a Kantianer. Oh, what a country where currents stream and wires and champagne in people's arteries, where every worker has a Marxist dream and every shopkeeper knows Kantian philosophy. Kulbach, like the character in this poem, um, went to Berlin with great enthusiasm. He immersed himself in German literature and philosophy, and his hope was to be able to produce a similarly rich literary tradition in Yiddish. Um, so in a sense, it wasn't just the Yiddish poet that had arrived in Europe, but Yiddish literature itself. Of course, Kulbach's enthusiastic arrival didn't really match up with his actual experience of Berlin. He didn't have a local audience. He struggled to make ends meet. He complained that he couldn't even get his hands on anthologies in which his own writing was published because it was all produced for export. Um, and so ironically, Berlin was this a kind of ideal artistic home for writers like Kulbach because it provided both inspiration and anonymity or loneliness. Uh, Peter Gay, the famous historian of Weimar culture, wrote, Berlin was hospitable to the stranger, not only because it gave its residents conspicuousness, but also because it allowed them to disappear. There was something about being in the shadows of Berlin society that allowed Kulbach and writers like him to experiment um, uh, without, without hesitation. For the, um, for, for the most part, the relationship between a student and vest student in interwar Berlin, um, even once imagination made contact with reality, can be characterized as a kind of a missed encounter. Right? German Jewish and Yiddish writing produced there remained for the most part separate. These were separate enterprises. But this doesn't mean that the writers and the literatures that they produced had no contact with each other. And so I wanna spend the remainder of my time just talking about a couple of examples of real German Yiddish encounters in interwar Berlin. Um, these writers were interested in creating forms of culture that either subverted or transcended the established or the assumed East-West divide. So as I said, to some extent, German Jews ignored actual East European Jews in their own backyard, but there were significant exceptions and more and more of these kinds of examples are coming out in research today. Friendships and collaborations were formed that crossed the boundary between East and West. One example of this kind of Cross, uh, this cultural cross-fertilization took place in publishing, specifically in literary journals and anthologies. So German Jewish journals like Der Jude and Die Freistadt featured Hebrew and Yiddish literature in German translation or transliteration. Um, the aim was to promote a multilingual transnational kind of pan-Jewish identity. You'll notice on the right um, is the image of um, this, this um, periodical called Die Freistadt, the sanctuary, all Jüdische Revue, so all Jewish or pan-Jewish Revue. This is kind of a response to, or maybe even an imitation of other pan-nationalist movements that are on the rise. This is the, this is, this is the, the era of pan-nationalism, be it um, pan-Germanism, pan-Arabism, pan, um, uh, right? Uh, this, this, was, this was the equivalent of that. Um, and on the left, you'll see um, an image of the Yiddish anthology Der, uh, Der Onheb, meaning the beginning, which was published in 1922. Um, and this was co-edited by David Einhorn, Max Weinreich, and uh, Shmariau Gorlik. It featured original Yiddish poetry and essays, but together with translations into Yiddish of German texts by writers like Max Brod, as Alaska Schuler, um, and also shorter works by other European writers, including um, Oscar Wilde and August Strindberg. The volume reflected a desire to bring more European literature to a Yiddish-speaking audience, while simultaneously finding a place for Yiddish within European belles lettres. So we can talk more about this maybe in the discussion, 
two kind of different aims or purposes for these multilingual um, uh, publishing endeavors, but both come out of, grow out of um, the meeting of East and West uh, in this, this kind of unusual moment. One place that uh, where German, Jewish, and Yiddish writers really did sit face to face um, was in the literary cafe. And the classic example is the Romanisches Cafe. The Yiddish poet Avom Nochm Stenzel, I mentioned before, referred to it as the parliament of Berlin's Jewish colony. So this was a place where a lot of migrant Jewish writers gathered and also where German Jewish writers uh, that frequented. Um, another common nickname um, that was thrown around was the Café Rochmones, meaning, which is the Yiddish word for pity, since many of the migrant poets uh, could barely scrounge together enough money for more than a single cup of coffee, um, probably much to the chagrin of the owners of the café. Um, at the Romanisches Café, uh, Avom Nochum Stenzel befriended the German Jewish poet Elsa Lasker Schuler. She initiated the relationship. She was about, I think, 25, maybe even more years his senior. Um, and she initiated this friendship by passing him a note um, that was scrawled on a napkin. And uh, it was addressed, she addressed the note to Hamid. She was known for giving her friends nicknames, Orientalist kind of nicknames, Hamid. Um, and she signed it uh, Prince Yusuf. This was one of her um, personae that she had invented for herself, Prince Yusuf of Thebes. She was known for her lavish costumes, her exotic personae, um, and she saw Stenzel as somehow fitting into this Orientalist um, fantasy that she had constructed for herself. She wrote a poem uh, and I've, I've given it to you here on the left, you'll see the original German, um, on the right, the English translation. I'm going to read it just in English translation, but for those who are able to follow, to look at it in German, I encourage you to do so because there are some interesting um, uh, variations um, or, or kind of subtle um, differences, let's say, in translation. Um, and this is this poem is titled um, Avram Stenzel, so it's dedicated to the Yiddish poet. When Abraham was very young, God named him Hamid. This I know, for it was only one leap year and 4,000 years ago. I was still hanging on the tree overshadowed by a coconut palm. My playmate, Abraham Stenzel, welled up from the sap of the tree. The biblical years were buried long ago. We two alone still wear the mourning band, longingly round our blue hat which modestly covers our brow before God. Hamid is the poet of jargon, the language of the ghetto. When he speaks it, childlike and touching, the folk song of my youth enters my heart. Sorry. He is a deep and fervent poet, lovable in his purity of heart. Often in winter, returning after midnight from the Romanische Café, we trotted weaving through the snow as through the desert, heads bent, Sahara everywhere, noble beasts of the desert, he and I. In his green Jordan eyes, do his dreams remember the patriarch? He gazes after the south wind, which caresses his black hair. I love the Kabbalah of his beautiful verses, which wear like a talisman his godly face. So this is a love poem, but it's filial, not erotic. As the speaker looks upon her playmate, her Spiegelferte, right? It's as though she's gazing into a mirror, discovering her ancient roots. She describes him as the poet of jargon, an oft used kind of pejorative term for Yiddish. He's the poet of jargon of the ghetto, who sings the Jewish folk song of her lost origins. He is for her the embodiment of the undifferentiated Orient. And walking with him through the snowy Berlin streets, they become two noble desert animals, kindred spirits, 
wild Jews, wilde Juden in her terminology. Um, so you can see exactly what it was that Elsa Lasker Schuler was seeking and what she thought she had found in Stenzel, which was a kind of embodiment of her own lost or suppressed Jewishness um, that had its origin somewhere there in the East, whatever the East might mean. It was also at the Romanisches Café that David Bergelsen, um, the famous Yiddish uh, prose writer, met Alfred Dublin. Bergelsen spent probably longer than virtually any other Yiddish writer in Berlin. He was there for 12 years, up until 1933, with Hitler's rise to power. And he was known for hosting prominent German writers and intellectuals in his home in Seelendorf, um, including Dublin, um, Piscat or Irvin Piscator, Arthur Kussler. Um, and Dublin read Bergelson's work very enthusiastically. He even published a review of his 1913 novel, Noch Alamen, which appeared in German translation under the title Das, das Ende vom Lied um, in 1924. And Dublin's take on Bergelson's writing couldn't be more different than Lasker Schuler's take on Stenzel's writing. Right? She saw Stenzel's Yiddish as an embodiment of her own Jewish origins. Dublin, by contrast, saw Bergelson as a consummate cosmopolitan. And in his review of Bergelson's novel, he insisted that Bergelson's writing is not at all representative of so-called Yiddishkeit, but rather European modernism par excellence. Both of these encounters, uh, Stenzel and Lasker Schuler, and Dublin and Bergelson, occurred at the same time in the same place. Both encounters point to a kind of mutual fascination between German Jewish and Yiddish writers. But these two very different friendships also reveal something about the broad spectrum of cultural and political affiliation among Berlin's Jewish intellectuals, whether they were native or foreign born. Um, so I'm gonna stop my share, my uh, screen share for now. Um, and just offer some, some concluding remarks before we open up to discussion and I welcome your comments and your questions. The East-West encounter that was so palpable in Berlin between the wars played a powerful role um, both for German Jewish and for Yiddish writers who were all forced to renegotiate their national identity during this time of really unprecedented political change. Whether they were coming or going, sojourners in Berlin or soon to be exiles from Berlin, these Jewish writers experienced the city as a threshold between East and West, a welcoming but also unstable home to natives and migrants alike. When we remember the Roaring Twenties of Berlin, this heyday of Jewish culture prior to its devastating erasure, um, we have to remember it as a multilingual transnational culture um, that was produced, at least in part, thanks to this unique encounter between East and West. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was a great talk. Um, thank you for delivering it, presenting it in your work. My pleasure. Um, yep. Thank you. And um, people are welcome to write their questions from the question and answer box. And um, we'll, we'll go through the questions um, with Rachel. Um, I see there's some already, but for now, um, I'll, I'll start the conversation with a few comments and questions as well. Um, Rachel, I couldn't help thinking, um, I'm getting a little into the nitty gritty here right away. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was interesting to think of Doblin and his his work about the Eastern European Jews as, as collateral victims of the collapse of multi-ethnic empires. And, you know, I couldn't help thinking of Joseph Roth because I feel like he probably had a very similar view. Do you know if that is true or not? Yeah, sense? 
I actually, um, in, in my book, when I, uh, I, I discussed Dublin um, and Zweig, as I did in the talk today, and, and Roth is sort of, Josef Roth is sort of the third figure that I, I bring into that discussion, um, uh, in, in which I, I sort of try to show that they all were engaging with images of East European Jews and all were engaged also in real, you know, real encounters with these Eastern European Jews and portraying them to different political ends. And yeah, I would agree with you that Josef Roth, who also just like, he, he actually like um, Arnold Zweig was also say he himself was an Eastern European Jew originally um, from the Habsburg, a Habsburg Ostjude, right, who ended up in Germany, um, was fascinated by his own sort of lost roots in Eastern Europe, also served as press corps in the First World War, so was stationed in the East and had that sort of encounter, and then was also deeply influenced by the influx of East European Jewish migrants to Berlin and wrote, of course, extensively a lot of reportage about this, um, right, writing about Grenadierstrasse, um, the kind of main drag of the Scheunenviertel, um, and uh, and and yeah, I would agree with you that he had a very similar sort of um, political take on the so-called Ostjudenfrage, the question of what do we do with Eastern European Jews? And one of the most striking pieces of writing that he produced on this, I think, is um, uh, in, um, he has sort of a series of little kind of uh, vignettes about the Scheunenviertel. And in one of them, he describes Grenadierstrasse, and I can't remember the actual title of it, it might be the Wailing Wall, but he describes Grenadierstrasse as one wailing wall after the other. And what he says is, this is the place where we see Jews lamenting exile, but it's also the place where we're reminded that exile is the raison d'etre of the Jewish people. In other words, the Wailing Wall isn't over there in Jerusalem. It's right here in Berlin. And the kind of wandering, the, the eternal, um, endless wandering of the Ostjuden up and down the streets of the Scheunenviertel is sort of a palpable reminder that this is the Jew's lot in life. And as painful as it might be, it's our role to continue to be uh, to be in the world, in other words, to continue to live in exile. And that was his sort of veiled, not so veiled, um, critique of Zionism, right? Where uh, he said that mm -hmm. the answer is not to send them off to Palestine. The answer is to find a way to kind of uplift and integrate them. But they, 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 are, they are a very visible reminder that this is the fate of the Jews. We are meant to, we are an exilic people, right? Um, so, and somehow, you know, in retrospect, of course, we can look back on that and go, well, that's, you know, unfortunate because um, we know we, we know where those Jews ended up, right? Um, but at the time, there there was um, there were mixed feelings about what it meant for Jews to be in exile, right? Um, now, what's interesting though is when Roth later published his second edition of um, the Wandering Jews, you know, Wanderschaft which came out sometime in the mid 1930s, he himself was forced to go into exile. And in the prologue to that second edition, he wrote, I now recognize that I as a German Jew am even more homeless than those poor Ostjuden from Poland, right? Um, in other words, he realized that it's not a desirable fate and, and we, know, we know what this means now. Um, but at the time in the 1920s, there was there was a slightly different take. There was more ambiguity and a bit more ambivalence surrounding that those questions. And I'll, then I'll, I'll bring up one more point. Then I'll open for discussion because I can see we're getting a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, okay. It's, oh, I see. It's oh, interesting. I to to, yeah, oh, it's not a race. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, Arnold, um, the Arnold's Arnold Zweig's work on, on the old student and the illustrations he did with Herman Struck. I yeah. think it's very interesting, you know, you were talking, you had that one slide with the quote about how the, well, the pictures of an elderly man and how he, he, if I remember right, please, please correct me, how he, in his face, maybe, is that how, he, how it was said in the book or yeah. in, in, he realizes his whole, his real homeland in, in, in Palestine, yeah, right, in Israel. And, you know, it's just so interesting because uh, to me, because in many, I think of this with Herzl, right? Uh, Zionism, 
uh, in a way, it's it's uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think of it in some ways as a very secular movement because I think of Herzl himself, who was quite yeah. secular, I suppose. And it's very interesting for these two men who also come, in my understanding, from this very uh, um, assimilated, secularized Jewish world, very uh, of modernism in Berlin, to be talking about these other people, the East European Jews, or they're Jewish themselves, as um, uh, having this uh, kind of religious connection to Israel. I feel like there's something in it where within Zionism, uh, there's, there's, and this is a good example, I think, of a, of a, um, <laughs> of a, of a, of a, almost like a kind of religion, but yet the movement itself is not exactly religious. It's more yeah. this ancestral connection and, and bonding with that and race, really. Jew, Jews as a race, let's say, a race that also has a, has a homeland somewhere. It doesn't, or it doesn't have a homeland, but this is where their ancestral homeland is. But I always think it's interesting that these two very secular <laughs> Jewish men in Berlin living in a modern world with, you know, cars and uh, uh, newspapers and, you know, the modern city. Not that this was not also true of East European Jews. That's another misconception I think people have Absolutely. of East Europe yeah. at that time, including these two men, clearly. But, or, well, they're focusing on one aspect, let's say. But... Um, that that there is this kind of idea of the Jews as a religious people, but yet it's 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 more always tied into this more idea of ancestry and and race, and I think that's a very interesting thing as well. Yeah, yeah, I I think um, oh, there's so much to unpack in your your comments there, um, which yeah. which I which I'm grateful for. You're 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 onto something really interesting and important, um, and there's a lot to unpack there. But what I will say is that. You know, I think one of the um, one sort of underst an understanding that some of these, let's say, de-assimilating or disassimilating um, German Jewish writers that I've mentioned in the talk were um, were coming to was that uh, they were trying to sort of understand what exactly had dribbled away in Kafka's terms um, when their parents' generation had sort of willingly relinquished the both the national and the religious component of their Jewish identity. Um, at, that they had defined themselves as, yes, belonging to the to the Jewish faith, but not practicing the way it had been practiced in the past. Um, and certainly not members of a, of a kind of pan-Jewish nation, right? Um, and this is in in acknowledging that this was not, um, that the steps that their parents' generation had taken were not sufficient in allowing German Jews to fully integrate into German society, they start to wonder, well, what exactly has dribbled away in the process? And what of that do we want to reclaim? And so I think you're absolutely right in saying that, yes, the Zionist movement was first and foremost, was, was predominantly a secular movement. Obviously, Zionism today has kind of a different flavor, but um, and, and it was for these writers as well. But what they're looking at when they describe the kind of idealized countenance of the East European Jew is, um, a, is, is this idea of pure um, religiosity that is in some way also connected to this Volksgeist, to this Jewish national spirit. It's, it's a way of thinking that we can't quite that is hard for us, I think, in our 21st century mentality to really understand because we've sort of eschewed all notions of, you know, essential national identity. These are kind of concepts that are anathema to most of us today, I think. But this is something that they were trying to reclaim. In Yiddish, you would call it dos pintele yid, right? Just that sort of kernel of Jewishness that they see as... Um, embodied by the Eastern European Jew. Now, they weren't interested in um, Hasidism per se. You know, even Buber's Hasidic tales weren't really Hasidic tales. He changed them pretty dramatically. He took out all the Gnostic elements. He took out any kind of supernatural components, which was really integral to Hasidism. 
It was this kind of humanistic take on Hasidism. So they weren't interested in Hasidism per se. They weren't interested in traditional religious um, observance. They were interested in this Volksgeist, right? And the Eastern European Jew becomes the kind of mascot for that. Um, and, and so it's, and which is also why um, they're not as interested in looking at the Yiddish modernists in their midst because they don't quite fit that they they don't fulfill that role, um, right? And um, and yet we also see, as I pointed out at the end of the talk, examples of of real encounters of actual. It's not that they weren't aware of one another, or that they didn't read each other's work, or you know. Um, but the idealized Ostjude was, of course, quite different from the actual Ostjude in their own backyard. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um... Yes, that's that's true. Like more Hasidic tales, less Kafka. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Kind of wanted to wanted to 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 re read or explore within the German Jewish world. Let's say right, right, um, right. I'll, I'll go on to the next questions here. Okay. Did the rapprochement between Western and Eastern Jews also have to do with the external threat of anti-Semitism? Did anti-Semitism make a difference between Eastern and Western Jews? I think that's a big question. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know how much. Yeah. You can so talk it's about it's that. very it's a dissertation I, in itself. No, it I, it is that's that could prompt a dissertation in itself. Um, and as I said, you know, I have to sort of give the disclaimer that I'm I'm giving you I'm giving you I've given you a bunch of different examples of different writers, but they're not representative of all German Jews or all Yiddish writers living in Berlin, of course, right? Um. But uh, I think that yes, this this what I was trying to highlight is this turning point of the First World War when it really did become painfully obvious that anti-Semitism, which for a long time German Jews in their kind of assimilated complacency thought was geared really mainly toward these these unsavory newcomers, right? These these impoverished. Um, Eastern European merchants and criminals and, you know, they, they, they assumed that the animosity was geared toward them. And it became really clear during the First World War, and even more so in the early years of the Weimar Republic, that antipathy toward the Ostjuden was very often a veiled attack against German Jews as well, right? And that just, and, and so those events that I mentioned, the Grenzschluss, the Right, the border closing, the census, those are just two kind of um, monumental events that, that we can cite as sort of examples of that. But it did become, in the rhetoric that was being used about immigrants, it became clear that they weren't just talking about immigrants. They were talking about German Jews as well. And German Jews were slowly starting to, were, were forced to become aware that they were being portrayed as foreigners as well, right? Um, and this has also a lot to do with the shift in um for over the, the 18th and 19th centuries, as German Jews are integrating into German society, they embrace this kind of cultural coding of what it means to be German, right? They, they embrace the idea of the Kulturnation. If we know our Goethe and Schiller, then we are just as German as anyone else. But it's the folkish definition of Germanness, of German blood, of German rootedness in the German soil that really starts to come to the fore in the early 20th century. And this is something that the Jews can never lay claim to, right? Um, and so I think, so anyway, short answer to the question is yes. I think the, rep, the, 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 the um, I don't know if I would call it rapprochement, but certainly the shifting attitudes um, of that Eastern and Western Jews hold toward one another um, has a lot to do with not just rising anti-Semitism, but the nature of anti-Semitism in this particular moment. Thank you. Um, do you know much about, I know you focus mostly on the literature, but do you know much about yeah. a musical con cultural conversation? I know the person asked you know, Kurt Weil, but I'm not sure Kurt Weil would fit into that. I don't know his background really. To yeah, say. I don't, I, I, unfortunately, I'm not the right person to ask about that. I don't know enough about music. I know a little bit more about visual art where there was an immense amount of cross fertilization. I even included an image in here by Lesser Uri, who was an Eastern European Jewish um, painter who painted many, many Berlin scenes. 
Um, uh, I can't speak to music, unfortunately, but it's an interesting question, particularly in, and this is maybe better, a better a question better posed to the presenters tomorrow, um, who are actual musicologists and, and could certainly respond to it. But it is interesting. One thing that I will say is that um, it's interesting in light of the fact that there's such a, um, I don't know if resurgence is the right word, but there's this kind of explosion of Jewish music and specifically klezmer music in Germany um, today. And I know that often the response has been, well, how can we describe this as Jewish renewal in Germany? This was not part of German Jewish culture. This is Yiddish music, right? This is not connected to Germany. The question would really be, is that true? I mean, how much in light of the fact that there were there 25% of Berlin's Jewish population is Eastern Europe of Eastern European origin. Certainly, um, if literary uh, influences were there, then I'm 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 I I think it would be sh very surprising if musical influences didn't exist as well. Um, so, but again, I'm ask ask the uh, tomorrow's presenters. I think that that would that's a question that I'm sure they would have a lot to yeah, to say about. Yeah. I can certainly think of Arno Nadel who was from Lithuania, and he mm -hmm. was in the 20s and was a cantor and um, a composer and musician. Mm -hmm. That's that's one person I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll go on with the other questions here. Was this encounter between East and West Jews, Western Jews, depicted in German silent film? She also says, great talk, thanks. I don't oh. know if you the answer to that, Rachel, but I actually do know myself yeah. of one movie um, that was a silent film, but I can't really remember the name of it. But basically, a man becomes who is a cantor in Poland goes to Germany. I'm sure someone else here knows the title, and we'll type it in the in the Q and A, which would be great. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And and anyway, he ends up coming to Berlin. But I think in Berlin he becomes a famous singer, like an opera singer or something. But then he also gets a little. De de denigrated by life in the cosmopolitan big city and it turns into I don't know all the evils of the city start deteriorating him let's say for lack of a better word and I can't remember quite how it ends I think he marries and goes back to be the can't me I don't know though exactly how that ends there but, you know I think um I I, I don't know enough too. about it I'm but sure there, there's th there is there is research though on it and I know that Ofer Ashkenazi um, wrote, I don't know that, I can't think off the top of my head of the title um, of the book, but he wrote a whole book about um, uh, silent film, Jewish silent film from this period, um, and makes a really interesting argument in which he says the fact that it was silent film um, lent it to, um, or sort of ma made it suitable for a kind of transnational audience, right? Um, and uh, he talks about film as being a really good, an important site of kind of transnational Jewish cultural encounters in the 20s, because these films were often marketed for these different audiences, um, sometimes, you know, and 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 the, the text placards would have been changed, of course, appropriately. Um, but in a way, even more than literature, it was sort of a place where this kind of, um, uh, this kind of cross fertilization could take place. Um, but again, I, I apologize. I wish I knew, I know much more about literature than about film or music. Um, but certainly Ofer, if that's some, uh, whoever asked the question, if that's a topic that's of interest to you, I would look into um, Ofer Ashkenazi's book on, um, on Jewish silent film, which I did read, but I wish I could remember specific examples. You no, know, I went through a whole thing too <laughs> I read about this and I went to some of the movies. They were here in New York at the Museum of Modern Art many years ago. Actually, with, uh, I think, uh, the, compo the musician Benji Fox Rosen. I was with him a few times with those. But yeah. um, it's been too long, you know? And I also yeah. am on the literature side of things. Um, one person asked, how frequent was it for assimilated we Weimar Jews, I assume that means, you know, the, the people who are German identified, to be fully bilingual um, in Yiddish and German? And I would guess the answer is not many. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I think that if we're, yeah, we're talking about the generation, this kind of interwar generation, um, I would I would say that the answer is probably not many, um, with the exception of those who were naturalized citizens who had actually come from Eastern Europe, which was not a small number. Um, and certainly, I think 
I think there would have been a sizable number, and I don't know the numbers that the, but there would have been a sizable um, group that certainly understood Yiddish fairly well, but probably were not Yiddish speakers because this was there was a kind of a cultural imperative to to speak German, right? To um, to um, Yiddish was still largely looked down upon. Um, and, um, but, but certainly, and of course, also the log linguistic proximity between the two languages, um, any German Jew who was familiar with the Hebrew alphabet would have been able to read Yiddish would certainly have understood Yiddish being spoken in his midst. Um, but, you know, the question of bilingualism is a, is a, it's kind of a tough nut to crack also, because what do we mean by that exactly? Even if they understood it, were they engaging with it at all? Yeah, we could. That's, I agree. Well, you but you know, then there's this this fascinating <laughs> this fascinating story about Kafka that's so often brought up when he spoke to the Bar Kokhba Society of Prague in 1911, I think it was, and gave this famous speech on the Yiddish language. Um, he was introducing the um, Yitzhak Lovi's Yiddish theater troupe that had uh, come to Prague to perform, um, and he speaking to this assimilated German speaking Prague Jewish audience and says to them the famous line, you understand more Yiddish than you think, you know, basically sit back and relaxed and you will find yourselves in the midst of Yiddish. And he was sort of making this argument, which tells us more, of course, about him than about Yiddish, that it's a language that you understand through feeling. And by virtue of coming back to this Jewish Volksgeist of your Jewish Volksgeist, you will understand this language through through feeling alone, right? Um, uh, and um, you know, so he's he of course wasn't that interested in Yiddish as a discrete language. He was interested in its symbolic value, its symbolic purchase for um, a group of assimilated German-speaking Jews. Um, so another question. <laughs> Franz Rosenzweig perhaps went the farthest in trying to rebuild a whole Judaism on the fragile catwalk connecting Berlin to the Ostjuden. Did he really know anything about the East? I mean, I think yeah. the answer to that might be also in his connection to Martin Buber, perhaps. Yeah. I'm making that he, up, but that would be my guess if that's I, I think yeah. I think that's I think that's actually a very good guess. Um, and of course the two collaborated um with one another, Bible translation and other projects. And I think that um Rosenzweig was also sort of under the neo-Hasidic spell of Buber um in, in that respect. So, but um and there's always this sort of story that's told about Rosenzweig's kind of religious awakening on the eve of Yom Kippur and discovering his Jewishness again. I don't know to what extent that prompted him to actually investigate the, the traditional Judaism of the East. I don't think that was of particular interest to him, to be honest. I think he was more interested in the project of Jewish renewal in the German context. Um, so I, mean, I, I don't, in that way yeah. they were both using East, the idea of this um, authentic East European Jew to revitalize the German Jews. I mean, it was yeah. actually kind of, you know, it's a keyword term these days to be sure, but a kind of colonization, let's say, of, yeah. the, of the East European Jews for the purpose of renewing German Jewish life. But yeah. it's uncertain how much people really were concerned about the actual lives of East European Jews living in Berlin, I think. Yeah, I could yeah. be wrong, Rachel. You're yeah, welcome. I mean, I the, it, it, certainly when we're talking about Buber and Rosenzweig and the and and this is also happening more in the early years of the 20th century. Don't forget, but although no, of course Rosenzweig and his 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 um, uh, lair house and everything is part of Weimar culture as well, but. Um, there is there is a shift certainly around the First World War in terms of even in Buber's journal Der Jude, there were so many articles that were written about the actual plight of East European Jews, but there they were more concerned with the political and material questions, right, than with East European Jewish culture per se, um, and so it's really a select few that I think are are 
really um, sincerely engaging with the contemporary Yiddish culture that is being produced, because most of that really doesn't fit their cultural needs, right? Yiddish writers were concerned with it sort of becoming part of European modernism um, and, 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 you know, less interested um, in performing Yiddishkeit for, you know, for, for, for others. So we'll take this as the last question, but okay. um, Monica, if you could say the questions in the question and answer, then maybe we can reach out and answer the other questions. Yeah, I'd be happy later. to do that. Yeah. yeah. So um, we'll end with this. Um, uh, uh, so the part, the part starts, I missed the first 10 minutes of your fascinating talk where you may have delimited the topic. However, it seems you print the topic is that it actually be German and Yiddish, but at the same time, Hebrew writers congregated in Berlin in the same period, bringing with them a critical attitude towards these assimilated German Jews, um, e.g. Bialik, who seems to be channeling a hot ha mm -hmm. ha sorry. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether the mirrored reversals you described, Ostjuden give up their veneration of the German Jew, and German Jews, their disdain for Ostjuden, is more than a Weimar phenomenon. So before you answer that, I'll say for the audience, because yeah. he wasn't here in the first 10 minutes, we're really focusing on Berlin in the 1920s, but it, it is, it does cover actually in reality a much bigger period. And for this talk, we're just focusing in on one place at one time. So yeah. that said, uh, Rachel, go ahead if you have yeah. any further comments. Yeah, so um, no, I, I appreciate the question and also the information contained in it, because of course we can't just limit the conversation. First of all, we can't just limit it to the Weimar period, um, nor can we limit it to German Yiddish encounters because the Hebrew piece is of course really important. And it's something that I um, explore in much more detail in my book um, in which I focus actually to, so I focus on four poets in particular um, in the book. I have a chapter dedicated to each and two of the four were actually bilingual writers, one writing in both German and Hebrew, um, Ariel Ludwig Strauss, and the other writing in both um, Yiddish and Hebrew, and that's uh, Uri Zvi Greenberg. Uh, and I, I spend a lot more time in the book talking about the significance also of bilingualism, the fact that these writers weren't inherently um, committed to just one language over the other in their work. So that's also an important thing to keep in mind. Um, Bialik is a good example of that. I mean, he's he's the national Hebrew poet, and yet he was, of course, also writing in Yiddish. And um, uh, um, uh, and Agnon was a Yiddish speaker, though he's really remembered predominantly as a Hebrew writer. Um, so there was a lot of crossover between Hebrew and Yiddish, um, of course, happening in this context. And um, uh, and I've kind of um, so I've limited the discussion for for the sake of this you know this context and this format, um, but that's actually one of the things that's so fascinating about Berlin in this period is that it did kind of offer this unique space in which writers who are increasingly forced to declare national and linguistic allegiance. Um, are able to kind of cross boundaries a little bit more freely. Um, by the time Uri Zvi Greenberg, for example, left Berlin in 1924 for Palestine, he suddenly sort of declared himself a Hebrew writer. Like, I'm not writing Yiddish anymore. It's not quite true because he did still write a little bit in Yiddish, but he was forced to sort of declare this identity, this Hebrew identity. And things were a lot fuzzier in the interwar period. Um, and what we sense is an immense pressure that these writers were under to um, make linguistic choices, um, but they still had um, an unusual amount of freedom during these years to experiment and to move between languages. Thank you. And then I'll, you know, I'll ask one more question though. I know I'm pushing it. I also wanted to say, <laughs> we put your, your book in the chat. So if people can check the chat if they're interested and see the book um, that we're discussing, which Rachel authored. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. And I believe that most libraries now should have an and the ebook as well, so it should be pretty easily accessible for those who are interested. Um, the last question, other than Elsa Lasker Schuler, um, can you mention any women artists or authors who came to Berlin? Becoming liberated from Orthodox life must have been a great attraction for Jewish women who wanted to be independent and able to express themselves. Oh, yeah. it's such a it's such a great question, and I I. Um, off the top of my head, to be honest with you, I can't think of really good examples. I do in the book talk about dedicate a chapter to a Jewish woman poet, but she was a German language poet, and that's Gertrude Kolmar, um, uh, um, who um, is kind of an. It's interesting her relationship to to Berlin and to the East, um, but certainly there are more examples and I can't think of them off the top of my head, which I apologize for. Um, but I'm, I'd be happy to sort of to, to respond to that question. If I have a way of sending out responses to additional questions after the fact, um, I'll be sure. happy to do that. Sure. We, we, we saved all the comments, all the questions. Yeah. The great. So, so we'll, we can send you the questions and then okay. you can answer what you'd like and we'll get their emails and so on. Cause everyone's registered for this event. So. Okay. We wonderful. Can reach out to them and organize that before we send them to you. Okay, um, great. On that note, I want to thank everyone for coming today. And Rachel, I want to thank you for being here. I think it's it, it's a very interesting topic to me, and it's uh, something to think about, uh, not just for this time in this place, but even in the larger world, you know, today, and with things going on in the world today. So I, uh, I thank you. And... Um, uh, we'll send you the questions that people still might have. Yeah, and, and I, I'd like to say th thank you to you for having me. And also thank you for these um, fascinating, diverse, and and in some ways challenging questions, which are sort of waking me up again and, and making me some of this material, some of the material um, I haven't visited and revisited in a while. And so it's making me sort of come back to um, these things. So I, I appreciate all the learned questions that are coming around. Um, and I will do my best to respond to them after the fact. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a very good afternoon. Remember uh, to check out Rachel's book if you are interested in this subject and want to know more. I can vouch for it. it was, it's a very good book, I think. So thank, thank you. you, Rachel. And everyone, Rachel, everyone else, have a good rest of the day. Take care. Thank you. To you too.